Good morning, everybody. 
Father, we thank you we come to this place and we can build our life upon you. And as we come into the holiday season and we see all the Christmas decorations going up, for many of us, it is a joyful time of celebration, of going to see the Christmas lights, the fake snow, or real snow. But for a lot of people, it's also a very sad time. It's a time they've lost maybe one of their favorite pets, they may remember close friends. So I just pray as we sing this song called Waymaker for anyone in this room or watching online that's going through a hard holiday season this year, that you would just bring peace, that you would bring healing and comfort because we know that you comfort all and draw close to you. It says you draw close to the weary and the broken. And I pray that those people are going through a hard times, that they would have family members and friends in their life that they can lean on, that they will listen to them, that they will just comfort them in this time of season. And as we sing this song, Waymaker, we know that you are the healer, you are the Waymaker. Give you all the praise.
y'all can have a seat. We're so happy that you're here today. My name is Tina Morgan, and I get to be one of the pastors around here. We love doing life around here, and what that means to us is that we are all about helping people build a life-giving relationship with Jesus, and we do that by loving God, investing in others, faithfully serving, and encouraging the world, and that's what we gauge everything about that we do. We want to encourage the world with the love of Jesus, and we're so glad that you're here, whether you're watching online or in this very room. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're just praying that this message that we're going to be hearing in just a few minutes will encourage you in your journey of whether you found Jesus and you're like, I'm all in for Jesus, or whether you're just like exploring and kind of figuring out what is this Jesus, who is Jesus, and what's that, what's that all about? Um, so we just pray that this message will encourage you. We would love for you all to get connected around here, and so there's a couple things that you can do. If you're new, we're so glad that you're here, and we do have a little gift for you right here. You can pick this up at the info desk. Just go out this door to the left and um, meet up with our team there, and they'd be happy to get that in your hands, and it does have chocolate, so that's always good. Uh, there is a couple things that will help you to get connected around here on your chair. One is just simply a little sticker to put your name on because your name matters. Each of you matter to Jesus and you matter to us. And so we want to know your name and we hope that you'd want to know our name. Some of us have little special red ones because Jaden makes them for us. So I bet you anything you could find Jaden in the back and he would have a special tag for you next week when you come because he's amazing. He delivers it to me. It's awesome. Uh, but yeah, that's one way to get connected. And then there is a connection card on your chair. It looks like this. And all this is, is a way for you to let us know you're here. So we invite everybody, whether you've been coming for 20 million years or this is your first time, fill this out. If you're here every week, just put your name on there and say hi. Lisa would love a little message from you. On the back, it has a little comments and prayer. We actually look at these every week and we pray together as a team. Lisa sends them out to all of us and then we also gather as a team and pray on Wednesdays for each request that comes in. So um, be sure to fill that out and we just, we wanna connect with you. Uh, you can also connect with us by checking out the website, social media, all the places. Uh, today, my husband, Matt Morgan, I'm gonna invite him to the stage as he shares the message. Thanks, babe. Good morning. I can't tell you how good it is to see you. You know, whenever you're like sick and you can't go see people, like you're so grateful to see people. And uh, last week was crazy. I, Saturday, I got up and I'm, I knew I was sick. Like, I better take COVID test just to make sure. And I could not get a conclusive test. So I had to pick up my daughter at the airport. She came in from out of town. We have all these people coming. I'm like going, this, no way. We cannot ruin this week. And uh, I, I, sure enough, I had to get a COVID test after that. And I did have COVID. And I thought, okay, I'm going to call uh, some of the board members. And so Travis and I were like, yeah, just go for it, bro. I mean, like, just, just rope off some, ro you know, just push back and man it up, dude. Go get it. And called Mike. And he's like, man up. Come on. I'm like, yeah, we got it. And then we called some wisdom. And uh, Marianne said, uh, no, you need to stay home and rest for you. Uh, and you need to stay away from people because some people are not very happy with uh, people coming in public with COVID. And so I stayed home. And she had, like, a nine-hour notice and uh, she did a great job last week on a nine-hour notice, and I thought, you know, you could actually do this, girl. I think we should probably get you to speak sometime, uh, but did a great job, and so, you know, having Travis here and being on sound and Sandy, his wife, being up, on, up here and the whole team, guys, thank you guys so much, and I, I want to tell you like, how, how thankful I've been this week for you because I had people, like, dropping off, like, immune vitamins, like, you know, here's how you, you know, stay immune to this stuff. I have all kinds of them now. And uh, loaf of bread and texts and emails. You guys are so awesome. And, and I also want to say just how thankful I've been just thinking about all of the people who serve here. And it's, it's kind of a weird job that I have because it's not just a job, it's a calling. Like, I mean, God changed my life so drastically as a teenager and my family, like from darkness to light, like I, it's God's like going, Matt, I want you to spend your life helping people know me. And, and it's, that's really cool, but you can't do it by yourself. Like it's not possible. There's no way that I could, you know, reach this community, let alone 
even 100 people by myself, you know? So like, and there's thousands of people here, just like my family, who need Jesus, just like me, who need Jesus. And I'm so grateful for you guys, and I just, I just wanna say thanks. And as we are like, you know, finishing up a series now, and we're gonna move into a Christmas series and then a New Year's series, uh, but as we're finishing this thing up, we've been doing a series in, in the, the theme versus Romans 12, 2. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, because he changed the way you think, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect, that God has a will for you. I just love that, that God has a plan for you, a purpose for you, a will for you, and when you connect to that, what happens is your life becomes, like you feel like it's fulfilling, I think that's what we all want more than anything. More than, than success or things, we want to feel like, hey, I'm doing something that matters. I'm doing something that God's called me to do. And I know he wants to do that. And so as we went towards Thanksgiving, this is my favorite holiday. And I know it's supposed to be Christmas and Easter, but this is my favorite because it says stop and thank him. Stop what's going on and just thank him. And, you know, I just think of all of that God has done for me in this song that when, I didn't know Freddie had this one in the set. I, I should have known because it's on our, like, list, but I didn't look. And, and it is on the, and Jaylee, my daughter, went to Africa with me, and she led this song, you know, and I ran out of that grave. And, and my, my oldest is my shortest. He's just this little spitfire. And uh, she goes, and none of the sound was working. Nothing was working right. And she just said, I'm going for it. And she just got these kids. And when it says, I was an orphan, she was in a room full of orphans. <laughs> and these kids, the next morning, we woke up to this blasting because they figured the sound system out. And every day, they would get up and they would have worship music playing and they would be up before us because they just wanted to give God thanks. And I, I get so, I don't know about you, but when I get around people who are thankful, it's contagious. And I do believe that the, the more comfortable that we are, that becomes our normal, like, you know, and, and I've, I've said to my friends, because we're all raising kids, and in our kids' world, what's normal is phones. They have a, a phone. And uh, our, our kids got to drive. That was normal for my kids. They got to drive. And not all kids get to, but my kids did. And it's normal for my kids to have their own bedroom, right? The American dream was not that. People ask me, what was the American dream? Like, what is it? Here's what it was. Own a home that kids shared bedrooms. That's how it worked. And, and have one living space where the kids are actually with you in the same room. It just drives you crazy, but they're there. And uh, like, like everyone's together. And, and there, weren't, there weren't man caves and she sheds and all that stuff. It was just own that thing so nobody could take it from you. And if you could have a car, that's going to get you back and forth. If not, just take the bus. And, and, and that was it. And it's gone from that to all of this other things, which it's not bad things, okay? But it, I found that the more comfortable we get, there's a plague that is plaguing all of us. And, and the plague is ungratefulness. And, and actually, the better things get, the more we end up just nitpicking everything to death. In fact, when things get hard, you ever notice when things are really, really hard in your family, you all buckle down and you go, we've got to get this thing done. It's, it's hard, and so we're gonna support each other. But when everything's going good, you're kind of like going, no, I get to pick what we're gonna watch, and yeah, yeah, like all this stuff, and, and we lose sight of some things. And right now, you guys, I know there's a lot of stuff happening around the world, but right here in North America is, is really the, the high time of, society, and we're at peace, other than we fight with each other all the time. And I, I've noticed some stuff that, that we can go after this idea of being ungrateful. I want to talk about it today. And 12 years ago, there was a, a comedian named Louis C.K., and uh, he was on Conan O'Brien. And, and, and he's a comedian, so they, they're colorful. We, we edited it, okay? But he, he did this bit on Conan, and it went viral everywhere. In fact, people were saying, you need to come do that bit on my show. Because it was that, it was actually, I would call it prophetic. This is what he said about everything is amazing and nobody's happy. Everything is amazing right now and nobody's happy. Like in my lifetime, 
the changes in the world have been incredible. When I was a kid, we had a rotary phone. We had a phone that you had to stand next to, and you had to dial it. Yes. Do you, know, you realize how primitive, you're making sparks <laughs> in a phone, and you actually would hate people with zeros in their numbers, because it was more, it was like, right. oh, this guy's got two zeros, screw that guy, why do I want to, <laughs> ugh. And then if, you, if they called and you weren't home, the phone would just ring, lonely, by itself. <laughs> and then if you wanted money, you had to go in the bank, for when yes. it was open for like three hours. You just stand in line, write yourself a check like an idiot. And then when you run out of money, you just go, well, I can't do any more things now. <laughs> right. I can't do any more That's things. That's it, yeah. That was it. And even if you had a credit card, they, the guy would go, ugh, and he'd bring out this whole shunk, shunk, and he'd write, yes. oh, you'd have to call the president to see if you had any money. It's all true, kids. You phone. had to call the president, yeah. It was ridiculous. Yes. Do you feel that we now... In the 21st century, we take technology for granted. Well, yeah, because now we live in an, in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the, on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots that don't care, because this is what people are like now. They got their phone, and they're like, ugh, it won't... Give it a second! Give, it's going to space! Can you give it a second to get back from space? I was on an airplane and there was internet, high speed internet on the airplane. That's yes. the newest thing that I know exists. And I'm sitting on the plane and they go, open up your laptop, you can go on the internet. And it's fast and I'm watching YouTube clips. It's am I'm in an airplane. And then it breaks down. And they apologize, the internet's not working. The guy next to me goes, this is bull <laughs> Like how quickly the world owes him something. Yes. He knew existed only 10 seconds ago. Right. Flying right. is the worst one because people come back from flights and they tell you their story. And it's like a horror story. It's they act like their flight was like a cattle car in the 40s in Germany. That's yeah. how bad they make it sound. Right. They're like, it was the worst day of my life. First of all, we didn't board for 20 minutes. Right. And then we get on the plane and they made us sit there on the runway for 40 minutes. We had to sit there. Oh, really? What happened next? Did you fly through the air incredibly like a bird? Did you partake in the miracle of human flight, you non-contributing zero? That you got to fly? You're flying! It's amazing! Everybody on every plane should just constantly be going, Oh, my God! Wow! Yes! You're flying. You're, you're sitting in a chair in the sky. Yes. yes. But, but it doesn't it doesn't go back a lot. <laughs> and it's, and it's not really little... You know, here's the thing. People like they say there's delays on flights. Yeah. Delays really? New York to California in five hours. That used to take thirty years <laughs> to do that. And a bunch of you would die on the way there and have a baby. You'd be a whole different group of people by the time you got there. <laughs> It's pathetic. I mean, like, it's just, this is where we live. It's, it is a total pandemic of, of I am just being really mistreated, and I deserve a whole lot more. And I just, I love that clip because it's so funny. And, you know, Colossians 3.17 says, and whatever you do, well, except if you're on a plane having to wait 40 minutes on the tarmac, <laughs> whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you got to go, well, how do you do that in the name of the Lord Jesus? giving thanks to God the Father through him. That we would be giving him thanks and saying, God, thank you for all you have done. Like, you are incredible. You're amazing. And what's really amazing about our life is the reality is there is always something negative. There's actually some really real negative things. Like, not just the, you know, rotary dial or the, the phone waiting to go to space. And, you know, it, there's really hard things we go through. And really, like, you, you want to vent it. Like, you just, ugh, you know. But at the same time, there's always really good things going on. And, and you go, well, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Man, I made it through the whole service last time. I didn't cough at all. Okay, here we go. I'm under control. Lock it in. But there's always something you can, like, do about that. You know, well, what do you do? The dog that grows is the one you feed. That's the one that grows. So if you're going to feed negativity, you're going to have negativity. And you're going to be surrounded. And how many of you have people in your life where you walk up and you go, hey, how? 
Good to see you. You don't want to say, how are you? Because if you say, how are you, you're going to be there for 45 minutes, and you're going to hear about their bunion and their whatever, and you're just going to go, my goodness. Like, do you, any of you have, like, signal with your spouse? We do. <laughs> Fake a heart attack, something. You know, it's like, it's just, she never, she, she misses a call a lot. Like, it's like, Babe, because she's so social and, you know, she's so caring of everybody. I'm like, just get me out of this conversation. We all have those people. Nobody wants to be known as a complainer, but we all, we all complain. It, it happens. And you might go, well, what is the, like, how does this progress? And I think there's two things that accelerate ungratefulness, and there's one thing that can reverse it. So there's probably a lot that accelerate, but these two things are the biggest, and I'm gonna start there, and that is ungratefulness has an ugly stepsister, and her name is jealousy. It's jealousy. When I see what you, I'm, I'm fine with what I have until I see what you have. Seriously, I mean, it's like, and you just, I, I actually, one of the guys in the church took pity on me because I still don't have a garage, and I do all the work on my car in a gravel driveway. He's like, are you kidding me? I have a shop, come over anytime you want. Turns out he has a lift in his shop, like a, like a car shop. And I'm like working on my, I'm like, this is incredible. And I look up, he's got a TV. He goes, yeah, during COVID, we watched you on that. I'm like going, that's awesome. <laughs> like, I actually really thought that was really awesome. Like, he has this really cool shop, and he's like, you can use it whenever you want. And, and it's like, I, I'm like, I got to just drop the whole jealousy thing. And just, that's really cool. Good for you. Because God's not against you having stuff. He's not against all that. But there's something that inside of us that just, from the very beginning, the first two people after Adam and Eve... If you're to like go, they're, they're siblings, okay? These are the brothers in Genesis 4. It says, now Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I produce a man. Uh, later, she gave birth to his brother, uh, named him Abel. And, and when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs of his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. That's what, that's what ungrateful people look like. They're always looking dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what's right. But if you refuse to do what's right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. We subdue it. We are its master. It does not master us. One day, just that's a good one for our society to understand right now. <laughs> one day, Cain said to his brother, hey, bro, want to go for a walk in my field? Yeah, let's go check it out. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Jealousy overtook this guy so much because what Cain did is he said, God, thanks. Here's some of my leftovers. And God knew that. It wasn't like that, that he didn't appreciate, like he actually like said, it was he knew his heart. It was just this obligation. Well, I should probably say thanks, you know? And he gives him the leftovers. But Abel was like, no, these are the very best of my flock, and these are the very firstborn of them, and I'm giving that to the Lord. And it wasn't the amount. It wasn't the, the gift itself. It was the heart where God went, that's what I love. Because, see, here's the deal. Guys, there's nothing we could give God that he doesn't already have. Like, we're literally, we're, we're moving through. Oh. Okay, uh, anyway. Uh, we're just passing through. And God owns everything. Like, it's all his. He says, I'm a steward of everything that he has, and he owns it all. And so there's nothing I could go, and God would go, oh, Matt, thank you for that. Boy, I didn't have that before. But what he looks at is he looks at our heart. He really loves the heart. It's never about an amount. And I'm not just talking about money. It's about the heart. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus says this. He sat down near the collection box in the temple. You might go, oh, they gave then too? Uh-huh. The church has always worshiped together. The church has always gave. The church has always supplied for the ministry of the church to the world. So Jesus is there, and they're, they're putting their money in. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. 
Jesus, this was like a big deal. He, he goes, guys, come here, come here, come here. And, and he gets his disciples, and he said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions, for they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. And I will tell you, like, I don't look at what anybody gives. I don't do it. Some people tell me about it, but I don't do it. Sometimes people will come up and they'll give me it. Like, here, here's my whatever, and that's fine. But I even try not to look at that. Uh, we have some people in our church that, that no doubt, like, Catherine's given me a, like a stack of quarters before. It was her bus fare home, and she said, this is for that missionary. I'm telling you, like, God sees a heart like that, you know? He sees in us, like, or our person who goes, you know, God has forgiven me of everything I've ever done. I'm gonna let go of this thing that happened to me. I may not be able to trust, but I can certainly forgive. I'm not gonna let this tear me to pieces. You know what? I don't understand why this horrible thing has happened in my life, but God, I'm just gonna trust you. Where else am I gonna go, God? I'm just gonna trust that you're gonna do something. There's always something in a heart that says, God, you have it all. I trust you with it all. And it's not about the amount. It's about your heart. And, and people have made the mistake in their life of hoarding everything that they can get a hold of because what we do is we go, well, in comparison, I have nothing. I don't have a shop. I don't even have a garage. What kind of poor person am I? I work on cars in the gravel. This is not fair. I can't do anything, right? I need to just keep all everything to myself until I can get where I want to be. And, and, the, and the line always moves, right? It always moves. Even like you get around some people and they're just happy. You're like going, well, they should be happy. Look at their life. My life was their life. I'd be happy too. But the reality is it, it's a moving line. Jealousy is such a, it just takes all of that, that ungratefulness and just fuels it. Well, the evil cousin of jealousy is greed. I go, well, that's offensive. Why would you say the word greed? I mean, nobody wants to be known as greedy, but greed is I'm gonna get, I'm gonna take all I can and I'm gonna amass what I think is enough and then I'll be able to relax. In fact, it's part of the American dream is to have enough to not have to work. Not that we wouldn't work. A lot, a lot of people, even when they're retired, they, a lot of years they're retired, you work more than everybody else. Uh, you're always doing something for somebody. But it's not that you have to work. You get to do what you want. And that's like we go, hey, that's awesome. I could do what I want. And, and there's nothing really wrong with that. But that's become part of like, that's what I want. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take everything and it's for me. Versus may, maybe there's, there's more there that I could, that I could do. And I want you to know something. God is not against you having things. He's not against you having money. He's not against blessing you at all. In fact, people will go, I don't even know if I could pray for God's blessing in my life. Well, Psalm 90 says, and, and may the Lord our God show us his approval, make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. That's prayer. Lord, help us be successful. Nothing wrong with that. Proverbs 21 says, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Talks about the ant who's always gathering, you know, during the summer when it, need, when it needs the food, when it already has all the food, but then when it can't get any food, it's already got it all stored up. There's nothing wrong with, like, having savings. Like, we're not knocking that kind of stuff. The condition is in here. It's not out here. So that, that's where you manage that, not somebody else. There is a balance of this thought. And so 1 Timothy 6 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And you've probably heard people say, money is the root of all evil. And you're thinking, well, that's a different passage. No, it's actually this passage. People just misquote it. Money's not evil. It's the root of all kinds of evil. And it's not even money. It's the love of it. I love it. I got to have it. It's, it's what I live for. It's what I'm all about. It's, it's, it's for me. That's, 
That's what, it's a root because it causes us to do things that we wouldn't normally do. It's like, I got to get to this level. I got to get here. And if I'm here, then I'm going to be good. But then the line moves because it becomes our normal. Money is not a morality issue. It's amoral. Here it's just paper and they just keep printing it. So, uh. <laughs> but even if it's gold, it's just, it's amoral. It's just this metal. Like, that's all it is. It's, it's nothing except for that. You can do good with it. You can do evil with it. By the way, you can't do a whole lot of good without money because everything costs money. So, like, this lady who's stuck out in our parking lot right now, that's her motorhome, and I, I pull in, and I'm like, going, this lady's taking up, like, the, some of you might be ticked off because, like, you didn't get a good place to park. And, and I, I knock on the door, and the Lord knocked on the back of my head and said, do not yell at this lady. Be kind. She's stuck. She's stuck. One guy after service, I said, hey, if somebody wants to go help her, I, I bought her a serpentine belt. I can't go put it on, but, you know, so he went out there, and it looks like she also needs a fan belt. So she's still stuck. Uh, but, like, this guy just, out of the goodness of his heart, goes, I'm going to go out there and do that. I'm going to go out there and do that. It, it's a heart of saying, you know what? Here's the deal. I can do something now that could be a blessing. And, and it's not about the amount. It's, it's about the heart. And so it does sometimes take money, though. I, I, it, was, it was $30. Can you believe that? Like, that's a lot of money. No big deal. But she needed it. And, and I think sometimes people do need us. And God does want to bless you so you can bless others. In fact, that's all scriptural. When you look at God's promises, you can read Leviticus and, and um, Deuteronomy. These are the, the books of the law. I'm just going to pick one. I, I literally, I, I searched this, so there's a ton of it. But I'm just going to pick one, Deuteronomy 28. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. And you might want to look this up because the blessings are incredible. What we need to know is God's love, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his grace are free. Everybody gets it. Jesus died for everyone. Jesus rose for everyone. Jesus has gone to heaven to prepare a place for everyone. Not everyone's going to receive his grace and mercy, but everyone has it. All they need to do is receive it. But God's blessings are conditional. Heaven will not be equal. We'll get there in a minute. It's not equal. God's blessings are conditional if we will obey him, if we will follow him. And that is in every aspect of our life. He's not against us being blessed, but he's pretty serious about greed. Ephesians 5 says, if you, could, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. And, and I kind of like to pick on the church because I'm part of the church. Like, these are my peeps, and I love them. To, I, I'm here for you. But the church has spent a lot of time pointing the finger about sexual misconduct and legalization of marijuana and alcohol and all the stuff. And we don't like to talk about greed, though, do we? You know what the worst day in a restaurant is for a, a, a person to work in a restaurant? Sunday. Cheapest tips most rude people right out of church. They'll tell you that over and over. I've read it in many places. I talked to servers. I actually did that when I was, you know, in high school, college, and it was true. And it's because we really have this, got to keep our stuff. No one likes to think of themselves as greedy, but all of us tend to try to keep our stuff. So you might go, well, what is greed? Greed is the intense and selfish desire for something. Intense and selfish. So it's for me. I'm going to keep it for me. And this is all for, I, I manage this. It's mine. God, it's mine. You can't touch it. It's mine. Instead of like, no, no, everything is yours, and I'm going to manage it the way you want. A grateful heart is hijacked by ungratefulness, jealousy, and greed. So here's how it sounds. I'm good to give so long as my needs are met. I'm good to give as long as I feel okay. In fact, you've probably experienced this where you had a little bit of a windfall. And you went, hey, I'm gonna help my kids with this. And hey, I'm gonna help that neighbor. And hey, I'm gonna, you know, because why? You feel like your needs are met. 
or even relationally, emotionally. You ever like have a week where you're like just, uh, and then someone drives by, they're like, they're going, stop smiling, you jerk. You're like, because <laughs> they're just being generous with joy. And you're like going, just get over yourself, you know, because you don't feel like that's been met here. But when it's met, oh, you know the most forgiving people are the people who've been forgiven the most? Jesus said that to Simon, the, the uh, Pharisee, when he was in his home, and, and, and the woman of ill repute was also there washing his you know, feet with her hair, or tears, and wiping them with her hair. He says, who, forg- who forgives more? Who's been forgiven a little or forgiven a lot? And he understood that. Because our needs are met. Greed just sucks it right out of us. Now, here's what you need to know. God wants to do something in us that is so, it's, it's, an, it's an actually incredible miracle. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you can read about giving, sowing and reaping. And I'm not going to read all it to you. If you've been around church, you've probably heard it. But I want you to pay attention to verse 10. It says that God wants to produce <clears throat> a great harvest of generosity in you. Now, you and I, if we garden, it's for fun. I don't understand you people, but... You do that for fun. <clears throat> it's not really for food. So these people are agricultural, and what they understood was, if I want to have carrots, I need to plant carrots. And if I plant carrots, I'm getting carrots. So when Jesus says this, okay, uh, or, or when, actually Paul wrote this, uh, but it came from the Lord, uh, to, to the Corinthian church, he, he says If you plant greed, you're going to get generosity. No, no, they understood this. The only way to get a harvest of generosity is to plant generosity, which means I do it before I have it. You don't have carrots until you plant carrots. You plant, like, whatever you do to get a carrot. Is it a seed or is it a part of a carrot? I mean, potatoes you do like part of it. I don't know. I don't know anything about this stuff. But you only get it if you plant it. And generosity extinguishes the fire of greed, jealousy, and ungratefulness. It's the only thing that puts out the fire. If you try to put water on a grease fire, it explodes in your face. Okay? So it doesn't help to give a greedy person more. But what does help is say, be generous. Give something away. And I love Thanksgiving because it says, stop, be ridiculously generous to each other. Prepare a feast, take time off, overeat, gluttony, okay, and celebrate what God's given you. And people will go, that's just so gluttonous. Do you know the feasts of Israel were those things? God would say, take some time out, be grateful, and thank him for all he's given us. And it's a brilliant holiday, and it's, it's extravagant, but it really helps us go, wow, God, thank you. This is really, really amazing. Jesus does a teaching on generosity and greed. It's found in Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to break it down, verses 19 through 24, and I'm just going to kind of stop at each, each level. It says, first of all, it says, don't store up treasure here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. I have a friend who played in the NFL for five or six years for uh, three different teams. I uh, was in the Super Bowl twice, like pretty cool. And he decided when he was uh, playing that he would invest all of his money. So he did a lot of investing in the stock market. And then the stock market crashed. Luckily, he bought a home, paid for it cash, and he bought a piece of property. And so he had a little bit, but he lost so much. And he was really bummed, but he was always very thankful that he had something. But he is like, he seemingly did all of it right, but guess what? Money here doesn't last. It doesn't last. So Jesus says, store up your treasure in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Now, remember, Balance. The Bible does say save. Nothing wrong with it. The, the house of the wise is full of found treasure, the Bible says. So, like, nothing wrong with it. But he's also saying there is an investment somewhere that you can to put it, and it never goes away. In fact, it's not just money. Jesus said even a cup of cool water given in my name is not overlooked. Right? So I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about all of it. All of our generosity. We're going to exercise. And there, Jesus says there is a log in heaven. It pays. In fact, there's t- the Bible talks about, look up rewards in heaven. 
Well, it's going to be even, Matt. It's going to be the first place life will be fair. No, it won't. Read it. Heaven's not fair. There will be people in heaven that have a lot more than other people because they invested. They, they, they gave. They sowed into God's kingdom, and it, it, does, it does pay back. Verse 21, wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will also be. Which is really like you'd go, Jesus, I think you misworded that. So Jesus is saying this, okay, got this $5,000. I got this kid with crooked teeth. I had three of them. Wow, 15,000 is a Harley. Nice one. Those stupid crooked teeth. I'm going to walk my little money over here, which I was so happy to do. I just felt so joyous over this. I walked it over here. I put it in this little mouth. Now, I look at your kids' mouths, and I could care less. Like, they could be the crooked. I'm like, dude, bless your heart. You crooked little thing is awesome. Doesn't matter to me at all. Like, right? Like, I just think your kids are great. I think my kids are great, but I wanted them to have straight teeth. I, over here, my heart was not there. But as soon as I put my $5,000 there, guess where my heart was? Now it's like, you guys, you either wear those retainers, because I'm only doing it once. You're on your own. You're in your 20s now. It's all yours. Do whatever you want. But like, my heart followed my money. I'm, I'm selfish enough, really, where even just the whole clothing thing drove me crazy with little girls. Like, you know, this had a, uh, and I, I'm, I'm a clothes hound myself. So, like, here's the deal. I, I, my heart would, after a while, it was like, I began to feel this love and joy and pride in these three beautiful little girls running around all cute. Like I would feel the pride of a car. In fact, more so. Like, it was like, wow, your heart follows your money. Most people think, oh, no, 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 just show me your checkbook and I'll show you what you love, which is true. But it wasn't because you, you didn't pay it because you loved it. You love it because you paid it. And, and, and here's the deal. A, a lot of Christians, we say things like, I love God with all my heart, body, mind, and soul. I just love it. And I love the church, man. They're, the church invested in my life. They are the greatest people ever. And I could tell you story after story about like Bruce Wade and Phil Dorfline. He saw Matt Morgan, 12 years old, getting kicked out of every Sunday school class that there ever was in Royal Rangers because I didn't know how to behave. And they thought, we've got the answer for him and those three guys that everyone's kicking out. We're going to have a group just for them. And, and it, it consisted of 45 minutes of them beating the snot out of us. Literally, like just like wrestling. Like that's what little boys need, okay? And they would just wail on us. Man, we'd come back with bruises. It was awesome. They'd read one Bible verse. They'd say, be nice to your mother. And if you don't, I'm gonna show up in the middle of the week and I'm gonna beat you again, you know? And, and it was the fun kind. It wasn't like they were like abused. It was just the fun. And, and then they said, we're gonna take you on this raft trip and huck thin this thing. We put a raft together that's four sheets of plywood, eight feet by 16. We're going to tie some inner tubes under it, which is just ludicrous to do. And then we're going to float the Carnation River for three days and beat you up again. <laughs> they changed my life. They changed my life. And, you know, you think of people that, like, did that for you, and you go, they're amazing people. And, and, and we think, man, if there's anything we need to fund, it's that. If there's anything we need to give our life to, it's that. If there's something I could do to be a part, that I really care about that. It's really, it's really, really important to me. But most Christians, what we really, really love is our cars. That's why we pay six to eight hundred dollars a month for them. For whatever it is. It might be. We love our cars. And we love our homes. And we love our vacations, and we love all that stuff. And, and I'm not saying that that stuff's bad, but less than 20% of American Christians tithe. It's not because they don't want to. It's because they can't. It's they can't. Verse 22. It's personal. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. 
But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body's filled with darkness. And if the light that you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? Now, if you only let, read that by itself, you'd go, oh man, the eyes, you gotta be careful what you're looking at. But he, this is the context of how we manage our stuff. And this is where I struggle the most. And I'm like, squirrel, motorcycle, snowmobile, boom. I just, I'd love to have it all. Not to be cool, just to enjoy it, just have fun. And a lot of us can't give up our time because we have to work overtime to pay the bills because our money's already spent. And we really can't give to God. It's not possible. Time, energy, money, relationship, any of it. And it's, it's really because what we really love is something else. And, and I, I, would, I would love to say, hey, you know what, just uh, be, be thankful. But what Jesus says is you've got to plant generosity, and it will grow. It's not instant, it grows. And then you have a harvest of generosity, and it affects every part of your life. In verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. It does not say you, you, can serve, you can't serve God and have money. There's a lot of people who have a lot of money who serve God with their whole heart. Nothing wrong with that. You can do that. But you can't serve money and serve God. How do I know if I'm serving God or serving money? Proverbs 22, 7, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. God expects us to pay our bills. So we get stuck. And I would say this. The opulence and the comfort that we have isn't producing the joy we thought it would produce. Especially if we're paying on it over time. We were snowmobiling with this uh, 20-year-old kid. He bought a brand new snowmobile on payments. And uh, he was freaking out because he broke something that cost $100. And one of the guys who's 60 years old looked at the kid, he's 20 years old, he said, if you're worried about $100, you're in the wrong sport. That's the cheapest thing on this sled. See, it was, it, was a max, it was a major struggle for him. And that's what happens in our life. You can go, that's gonna make me happy, that's gonna give me joy, and in reality, it just makes you miserable. Because it costs you so much more than you thought, not just financially, but emotionally. And it just weighs on you. And I believe that God wants to put a, a heart of generosity in us, and here's how we do it. We rearrange, and we exercise this idea of generosity. Now here's the deal, that takes time. My mom and dad came to Christ when they were 35 years old, living a debt lifestyle, and the Bible said to tithe, they just decided to do it, they're crazy like that. Um, but God has blessed them. It's taken a lot of time and a lot of effort. It's very hard to do. So I recommend you take some time, you adjust. I, I recommend you really pray it through. But you could actually start with something. People would say I'm nuts because we're doing this one day to feed the world offering, where you give one day's wage to, to help children get fed through Convoy of Hope. And they'd say we're nuts because as of the financial report, which we got last week and we went over it at the board meeting, we're $82,000 behind for the year. So at that pace, two more months, will be $100,000 behind at the end of the year, which what we've done is cut budget out, cut staff out, cut budget out. So we're not being generous to our kids. We're not being generous to our youth. We're not being generous to our staff community. And so we need to make it up somehow. So people would go, well, you need to like focus on you, man. Focus on you. That's what we do. We focus. We got to do this. And, and, and actually, it's opposite. It's opposite. We're going to plant some generosity. And so if you give the one day, all of it goes in. And go online, go, go like the pull-down menus, you just go in there and pick Convoy. 100% goes there. If you give your tithes and offerings, it goes there. But if you want to give to this Convoy thing, you might go, I can't even do a day's wage, and I've been there. Fine, do something. Just do something. In fact, you might just go, God, what do you want me to do? By faith, do whatever God asks you to do, and watch what God does. It's really amazing. Because it won't be just your finances that change. It'll be this. And that's more important. 
So I'm gonna pray, and uh, there's a video that just explains the one day. It's gonna be open for a few weeks because we all get paid at different times. And uh, the band's gonna play us out here. There's a, a couple of things we want you to know. For Christmas, we're gonna be generous to uh, Lifehouse Ministries, which is for uh, moms who are raising children. Uh, many of them are single moms, some of them are not. And uh, they get resources from Lifehouse. And we uh, give the building over there to them for very, very, very low costs. And all the heat is paid and all the internet and all the stuff is paid. Uh, but they, that's a ministry that we go, that's something we'll support. And so this is, you can go out there and get a tag and this one here is for Cheyenne, and she's a mom, and you can help Cheyenne, or you can help anyone. And you're gonna get the gift, you're gonna wrap the gift, you're gonna bring it back by the 17th. And we've done it every year, and you should see these ladies. They're like going, I love this church. And some of them start coming because of you. It's really, really good. Um, so that's going on, and uh, there'll be other things that are happening. I, I, I believe there's another announcement. Oh, the, the gift, the uh, decorating the church. That's happening. So. Uh, decorating's on uh, Saturday, December 2nd from 10 to 2. Freddie's overseeing that, and Freddie's like going, Matt, get me some volunteers, so. Freddie's fun. He's a good guy. Uh, anyway, it's gonna be great. I'm gonna pray. I love you guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, Lord, we love you. We need you. I pray you'd help us to exercise generosity in our life in every area, even a smile this week, or a tip that uh, is, is, is a, a, a really good tip for somebody or even just joy when we send back the meal because it's cold and we just ask for it to be hot and thank them and tell them it's not their fault. Um, I pray, God, you just help us to be generous to our neighbors, the ones that are smoking weed off their back porch and it comes into our house. And we just set that aside and say, man, I, I don't even know if you know Jesus or not. If you don't, I want you to see him in me. I pray we do that with all people around us. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. When you think of poverty, do you see a face? Here's one. Here's another one. Here is Kate. Kate lives in the Philippines, a small set of islands speckling the South Pacific. Kate's face is only one. One of 30 million faces, lives and hearts existing, breathing, and surviving in poverty. In the Philippines, just one set of speckles on a globe full of Kate's. Kate's face is only one. One face out of tens of thousands that Convoy of Hope feed through one day to feed the world. in San Jose de Monte, a squatter relocation camp created with good intentions by the Filipino government. Sometimes I, I, go, to, I go to bed, I sleep, I, I have no food in my stomach. It's exciting when the food comes in our house. I receive the food in, from the church every Saturday. But it doesn't stop there. Kate and her friends also receive a portion of food to help supplement their family's meals until the next week. Kate will be back next week, and for many weeks to come. That's because she knows the importance of food, because she's experienced too many school days without it. If I don't have enough food, I, I can't concentrate in my study and I can't understand what my teacher was saying to me. The food that they give to us, it helps me to memorize the, the lessons that my teacher told me to, to memorize. You see, Kate has placed a lot of value in her education. She's smart. She knows that she can provide a better home, and more importantly, a better life for herself and her family. That's why we keep seeing Kate's face week after week. Well-nourished kids like Kate thrive in school, at home, and for the rest of their lives. 
And that's why one day, when we think of poverty, we won't see Kate's face. Thank you, because the food that they give to us will, will not be... <laughs> will not be wasted.
thank you for coming. Before you leave, just like Tina said, if you want to sponsor one of the children for Lifehouse Ministries, right out there in the information booth, talk to Lisa, and she'll give you a little card for either a single mom and their child. God bless you guys. See you next week. like 10 minutes I'll watch some videos but I want to get the drums like dialed for the sound and I'll save that setting